director, uh, Agape Di Fili. Uh, it's very nice to see in this room I love so much. I feel nostalgia coming back home, I have to say, in a sense, and Cathy will finish, feel it soon coming back. It's lovely. I miss the wisteria, but uh, this is still a lovely room. And I can see that the throat microphone is working uh, because I always go over and look at the slide and don't and forget microphones. Uh, it's at last I'm able to present this book. Uh, it competes well with the elephant in time of gestation, uh, and it goes back to the early 1950s. Uh, I think it was 1953, my teacher of Latin and Greek, John Morrison, had a friend called John Morrison, uh, and he came down to speak at our school, and he brought with him the model of the ancient trireme. And then later I went to college and was taught by the other John Morrison. And uh, when he went off to build colleges, uh, and eventually the trireme, he told me that he wanted me, when I graduated, to help his project. He'd learnt that I came of a family of seamen, dockyard workers, and fishermen, and he said, well, you'll obviously be helpful. I think I know what the ancient trireme looked like, but you must give me the dimensions. So when I graduated, uh, I started work on what is this book. This is the book, and there is, there's a copy somewhere, I hope. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. And nice poster. And there are, before we forget, that anybody who's here can pick up one of the brochures, and that will get you a reduced price from the terrifying price, I'm sorry, which the book has caused. But it's been a long time coming. And this, we have to thank Lazarus Colonas immediately. I'll thank more later for this lovely picture. And a lot of people have said, oh, what a lovely book. We've seen this in Blackwell's or the library. And one thinks, yes, and it's a nice cover. I wonder, but some people say, but we actually opened the book. The funny thing about it is that, that sign there says, no photographs, or so in Greek. <laughs> But this came from the 36th Ephoria at the instigation of Lazarus, with whom we've worked happily on the presentation of this book. And uh, he couldn't be here tonight, but I'm seeing him this week. And now we have the job of encouraging our many colleagues who gave us their preliminary results in helping about eight or nine publications of ancient shipsheds uh, to fruition. I must obviously thank at this stage all the members of the archaeological service with whom we've worked, and Mrs. Vlindoni, Blazaki, Valaka, well, I could go on. Uh, my friends in particular uh, from Rodos, where I worked, and now uh, academician Petrakos, with whom I've been working since my retirement. Uh, many Greek colleagues have shown us around their sites, Maria Petritaki, in Piraeus, uh, and of course the various ephors of the Ephoriana Leon, uh, Della Porta, Simosi, and their predecessors, Melina Philemonos in Rhodes. It's been a happy, uh, happy task to thank them all. And uh, it's nice to see so many of you here tonight. What happened was, to come back, John Morrison, in his later years, he had had the idea in 1939-40, he knew exactly what the trium was like and published an article in the obscure periodical for classicists, but not for maritime specialists, in Mariner's Mirror. And he was convinced, and that's not tonight's lecture, that he knew the 
how to get the three banks of rows into the trireme. And he told me to go off and provide the dimensions for him. And that involved looking at all the published work on ancient ship sheds, not a happy word, uh, which I sent him. And the next thing I knew was I got a copy of the book. I didn't, I covered myself by saying I never saw proofs. And between 62 and 68, a certain amount of new work was found. But I was very thrilled. If, if you're a postgrad, you don't object when your professor uh, uses your text. And uh, this important work included a chapter, which I was very glad to see my name in print in this book. And then John Morrison launched debates, and there was a famous tri trireum controversy, the longest correspondence in the London Times up to that date, and a man called John Coates. And here is his first idea of what the trireum was like. And a man called John Coates said, well, I haven't shut I'm the chief naval architect, I'm, I'm about to retire, can I help? And so now it's traditional that the chief naval architect of the Royal Navy on retirement becomes a consultant to our project. We, don't always un we haven't always understood their calculations, but it's been very good to have that cooperation. And well, he went through very... Then he met Boris Rankoff, uh, but here's John Coates, in, and our book is dedicated to Morrison and Coates, who were our inspiration. And uh, there are wonderful pictures which we don't show of John Coates in front of the Olympias in recent years. And here is what it was all about. And when it was built, uh, John Morrison had persuaded one Rankoff, Boris Rankoff, a famous Oxford oarsman, I viewed from Cambridge, thought he was a baddie because he, he secured six Oxford victories in a row on a great dispute, but in fact he and I have had a long and happy cooperation then. And he organised the, row, the rowers for the trials, and there are people here, I'm happy to see the old Olympias guard here, uh, to do the sea trials, and I think this is actually from the first year of sea trials, this picture, a trireme trust picture. And when I left here, on my last year here, we set up a John Morrison fund, and Boris came out, and we were talking, and it's lovely to see uh, Admiral. Admiral, the image that retired. Uh, we had a lovely reception on... Averof. On the Averoff, yes, my memory is there. And Boris and I talked, and we said, well, let's at least try and get the money and finish the job of Morrison and Coates, which is what we've tried to do. <laughs> and here is our attempt. Uh, and we've had a splendid team. Yari Pakkanen, as our classical architect, was at Royal Holloway with uh, Boris and the college was very helpful in sponsoring our getting Lever Hume Trust money, which if you're in the hum human sciences in Britain is a crucial source, and generous and patient. They waited 10 years for the book with never a complaint, never a chasing letter, but that's been splendid. And Henrik Gerding, who I'll show later, uh, joined us and then went to a research post back in Sweden, succeeded by Judith McKenzie and Calliope Biker who we're happy to see and we should be happy to hear from tonight. And here is the end result of our work. A teamwork is not always easy and publication is not always easy, but we've got there in the end. And it's been a great experience. I must say it's some relief. And my wife groans. She said, well, now you can talk to the family. And then I sort of say, well, I'm building up a material for the second edition. If anybody wants to ask questions, we have a little list of new finds and new thoughts, but uh, my wife groans at that. But there are a few projects we've been talking today about another one. And just from our book to show what we're dealing with very quickly. This is all the sites with references to or possible ship sheds in the Mediterranean. 
I won't go into just to give the, the Impressionists, much less in Italy, and Roman shipsheds remain a problem. We haven't got enough. We've got literary evidence rather than archaeological, and maybe the porter's excavation will change the picture. And then, in fact, it is the Aegean world which has given us most of our evidence. Uh, and then, just to show we are not totally Greek-minded, although I think, I don't know what Yanni thinks on this, I think these were Greek architects. Carthage. I, th I sort of feel, but how does one prove it? We don't, as we have for, uh, for Rome, we don't have evidence of a, literary evidence of a Greek architect, but here we have the famous military harbour where Henry Hurst has still got volume two to publish. He's published the ship sheds around the edge, but not on the island. We should be on to him. And the wonderful drawings of Sheila Gibson, uh, which uh, we have kept, we have now in Oxford, and um, which Judith was curating. And Marseille, just to show we, how far west we have it, found when they dug down below water level to build underground car parks, which I don't think have ever been built, not when I last went to Marseille, looking at Calliope, no, one of those things. Anyway, a, a row of open slipways and a row of covered ship sheds, which implies a roof. And here are the remains of the timbers lashed to pegs at which ships were hauled and perhaps this is a shipyard in the sense of shipbuilding. Maybe this is. Ship sheds were not normally for uh, shipbuilding. This one maybe. And a nice model in the museum showing roof ship, ship sheds and open slipways in the fortified city. And Thassos Jean-Yves Ampere has promised me they're nearly there on publishing this. And this is a, a somewhat speculative plan. And then, very quickly, yes, up here, remains of ship sheds with some controversy about the restoration. So we look forward to having a good debate with Jean-Yves about Thassos. And when I retired, I happily went off to the Greek West and learned about Sicily. And we have now the fine remains. That's Yari's idea of the roof, yeah? Uh, um, I mentioned these because there's a project, a few things still to do. Uh, you've got ramps of sand, which we were just excavating. And how do you preserve permanently? ramps of sand or gravel. Uh, a wonderful site which I've enjoyed working on and here, here you see very well the, the remains of ramps of sand and a Roman villa which they didn't allow us to demolish. Sadly, we had two metres of Roman levels every year and we got every year we got to the Greek levels as the rain started in October but that's another story. And here is our plan and that's the complete dockyard. And we tried, and my, another site which I was asked to do back in the 70s, an Italian wartime excavation interrupted by the Royal Air Force, as I've since discovered. We found the archive in recent years, and uh, Bartocini, a famous Italian architect, was soprendente of the Italian province of the Dodecanese, of the Aegean Islands. And we have remains of, t the interesting thing for our study was that there is a, a dividing wall and there's normal broad ship sheds, six and six and a half metres wide, and the other side of the wall, narrow ship sheds. So for once we've got evidence for a dockyard for two sizes of ships. And this is Hellenistic roads where you have the much larger number of varieties. You have fours in one direction, and you have two and a halfers, and one and a halfers, the Tremiolii and the Hemiolii. And this has been published, and I've now got some work to do on publishing the archive from the original excavation, interrupted by the Royal Air Force. And just to show the problems of conservation, I mentioned this only 
to say one of the projects we've still got to do, and we want to work with Professor Yon from Lyon, who excavated Kition in Cyprus, is how do you preserve, that's the brain construction, but how do you preserve mud brick, rubble, and loose rubble, and plastered over? That's going to be a horrendous problem. So we did apply once for an EU money, but uh, we couldn't lobby the Ministry of Transport in a suburb of Thessaloniki. It was beyond our ability. But we hope the next time it comes round, we'll have a project in. And also, Kitty on the reconstruction, also to cover, this is now, Calliope is working on this, so I won't stop there, but we're pretty certain that, that there, the old excavation dug away remains of ramps. And it would be wonderful to have a project to actually get professional advice about how one conserves ramps of sand and gravel so that we can have tourists visiting, which we can't do at the moment. And here, just to show uh, two of our team, Calliope will be talking more professionally in a minute, but just to show Calliope and Henrik, then in our team, doing a survey of the remains at Kerkira. And to finish, one word about my great collaborator, Paul Knoblach, who worked with me in Rhodes, in Phasalis, in Lycia, and then he had worked at Edina. I do hope that they, that idea of building a cruise ship harbour in Agana is never carried out because that would be built over this part of the famous ancient harbour. I'm not supposed to say that bit. But. And to show the work of Judith, uh, this is our reconstruction in the book. We think we've got just the right size of dockyard for the population of Agana. And to leave you with one thought, Population size, dockyards are a wonderful indication. Dockyards show you the size of your fleet and you can then start guessing and arguing about what percentage of your fleet were male citizen rowers, but at least you've got really a very important bit of evidence for population size, one of the gate. And we had Morgan Hansen arguing with us for half a day in his vigorous and definitive way he said I was talking nonsense, but I'm still alive. <laughs> and then, sorry, am I? Is this over to Yari? It is, yes. It is, is. Just to finish again with this wonderful air photograph, which unfortunately doesn't appear in the book, one of the two photographs the 36 Epheria gave us, thanks to Lazarus Colonas. Thank you. Over to Yari. give some freedom of movement. Uh, so. uh. um, as we see in the slide, so the, the first excavations were already carried uh, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century and then uh, recently carried out by Lazarus Colonna. So uh, I think it's until uh, 95. And, and very warm thanks are due to Colonnas uh, and the 36th effort that we actually were able to uh, visit the closed site in, in 2006 with the, uh, the team uh, from our research uh, project and also providing these very important photos. Uh, in the recent excavations, uh, the complete uh, complex of six uh, ship sets has been excavated um, and they are the, the best preserved uh, ship sets in the Greek world and would really warrant a, a full lecture, but, but uh, I'm just going to present a couple um, notices on the uh, architecture um, at the site. So they are um, one of the ones that we can be 100% certain that the, the full length of the whole ship shed is preserved. So on the back of the ramps to the, the front piers, it's about 42 meters. And also that the, uh, the colonnades, they're actually terminated by T-shaped piers um, at the end of it. And, and they are very important functional part of launching and slipping at the triremes. So I think uh, it's highly, um, highly likely that, that uh, uh, the T-shaped piers would have been a standard feature of uh, uh, Greek ship sheds. And also 
We have uh, the inclined top surfaces of the capitals, and they indicate that the, the roof must have been uh, continuously sloping. And uh, um, without a detailed published drawings of the capitals, I think the, uh, the roof details will need some further uh, study, and I hope that will come with uh, Colonna's work. And moving closer to uh, home, then uh, the, I'd say, equally uh, exciting series of uh, ships of complexes uh, uh, which house the um, Athenian uh, fleet. And this photo is from the archives of the German Archaeological Institute and uh, actually taken just a few years after the, the Zea excavations by Dragatsis and Dörfer was done in the mid-1880s. Uh, and probably actually taken by Wilhelm Dörfeld in, in 1891. And the, the excellent documentation uh, by Dörfeld is highly valuable uh, since only a very small part of the uh, excavations is currently visible. So most of the, the, uh, the site ha has probably actually been uh, uh, destroyed. And also verified by the recent Zea Harbor project uh, that uh, uh, Dörfeld's measurements are, are spot on, so he's an excellent uh, architectural uh, archaeologist. And taking the, the so Dörfeld's uh, section drawings and combining it uh, with the, the uh, very precise work from the Zea Harbor project. Which one? Uh, am I too close? Hmm. Do you have more from your Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> but I have to think where it is. <laughs> it's on silent, but, but uh, I'll just leave it here. Yeah. Okay, so um, um, uh, combining uh, Dörfeld's uh, sections then with um, um, the Zea Harbor project uh, sections, it becomes possible to make this one possible interpretation of the, uh, the archaeological remains. And, and this is actually quite different than uh, the one uh, presented in the uh, Zea Harbor project. And I think the key issue here is looking at whatever is the floor of the phase one. And it's a very, very shallow inclination and uh, quite likely, I'd say almost certainly, actually follows the natural slope around Zea. And when you protect that, and I'll, I'll even look it into the, uh, the excavated bits of the uh, Zea Harbor project, uh, it seems that, that um, um, it must come to a natural end uh, around here, and that slope then also matches the later phases two and three. So um, um, I think that that's, uh, um, uh, this is the most likely reading uh, of the, the archaeological remains at Zea. So I, I've argued for that in detail in the, in the um, uh, shipshed volume. And uh, the uh, one other issue that the, the naval inventories from the 320s uh, BC record that Zea had 196 shipsheds. And this has led to a, um, quite a lengthy discussion about uh, how could you actually fit uh, all of these uh, shipsheds uh, into the space or the shoreline uh, available at Zea. And one hypothetical arrangement is presented here, and it mainly actually takes uh, into account the possible silting at the northern end of the harbour. So this is uh, uh, imposed on, on top of uh, Graves' uh, map from uh, 1840s. And um, uh, uh, just an additional uh, detail, so that's uh, actually the recently discovered Philon's arsenal or Skevathiki um, or, or on there. And in the arsenal inscription, uh, it actually says that that's, uh, it's uh, a homo degon with one of the uh, shipshed complexes. So. Uh, I've actually drawn the, um, in the reconstruction that, that uh, uh, even if it's not a same uh, roof on the, on the two, it actually could be that, that you have a continuation of the roof from the, the uh, arsenal uh, over the, the uh, shipshed uh, complex. Um, the, I've actually since heard, that my reconstruction is from 2011, that there was a talk at the Danish Institute uh, uh, about that actually um, also talks about this issue that, that uh, was it last year or 2012, I think it was. Yeah. So this shows that that's a good idea, so don't uh, go in, in uh, sort of singles. It's, it's always that somebody else has the same idea as well. So, yeah. um, and uh, in this one, the... Um, 
it's actually not possible to fit the sort of full width of the, the ship sheds that are as, as they are currently excavated. So there would be a variation like, like David was showing from, uh, uh, from the road ship shed, so that there would be some narrower than the, 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 the very wide ship sheds that are, are excavated by, by Dörpel and, and Dragatsis. But there's another possibility, so just as an as a, uh, uh, alternative, that if the siltation has been even more drastic, you could even open, open up more space at the northern end of, of Zea. So unfortunately, this is uh, out of bounds now for, for excavation. So uh, you, you can actually uh, present various ways of uh, uh, fitting in the 196 ships on the, on the shoreline uh, at Zea. And, uh, um, and this is my 3D uh, reconstruction uh, based on the, uh, the available evidence. And, and uh, uh, we do have quite long um, uh, slipways. So, so there's no way that, that the tri could have been as long as the, the identified slipways. But, but I, we don't think that it actually would have been possible to fit two ships in the uh, uh, ship sheds. But they have the additional benefit that they get the tri much further out from the, the seashore, so keep them also drier. Um, well, when you get uh, winter waves uh, hitting the, the shipshed complexes. And also you get plenty of workspace um, at the lower ends of the, of the shipsheds. And uh, um, one possible uh, way of looking at the, the building uh, programs, uh, um, so it certainly was a very, very large building project to build nearly 400 ship sheds um, around the, th the three harbors of the Piraeus. And uh, um, uh, it should be em emphasized that it's, it's one of the larger uh, public undertakings uh, of the polis of Athens. And it's very surprising that textbooks on Greek architecture hardly pay any attention at all uh, to ship sheds. Uh, I think we could quote, uh, uh, as an example, uh, the 1970 volume by uh, Boersma on the Athenian building policy, and it's extremely laconic, so I can actually read the whole section that he writes about the, the ship sheds. And he describes them um, under, uh, in the Piraeus under minor works, and, and this is the full quote. So, the growth of the uh, fleet necessitated the building of dockyards and the maintenance of harbors, end of quote. So that's it. Um, but uh, I think one way of looking at it would be sort of comparing the, the, the ship shed uh, complex in the Piraeus with the the uh, city walls, so both utilitarian projects, uh, military projects. And, and if you just look at the materials, uh, you can al almost immediately see that, that uh, uh, both are very, very significant uh, um, architectural projects. But we can actually push the evidence uh, quite a bit further. And uh, um, I, uh, in one of my chapters in the, uh, in the volume, or actually my only real chapter in the volume is about the uh, economics of shipshed complexes. And I try to re-evaluate re the full range of available uh, source material. So ancient textual sources, 19th century building manuals, um, archaeological experiments, eth ethnographical uh, studies. And they all are potentially very important in estimating uh, the labor input. Um, and very, very rarely you see it actually used all of this class of material uh, jointly together. So for example, in ancient Greek context, it's possible to show that the price of locally quarried uh, building stone and roof tiles manufactured at the construction site uh, it has very often been exaggerated uh, when uh, these evaluations had only been done on the basis of in inscriptional evidence. So if you look at the, there's a, a Janet Delane's uh, uh, work on the baths of Caracalla is an excellent one that, that she really does collect uh, uh, different classes of material and uh, uh, you can actually come up with quite a lot lower prices for, for uh, different categories of materials. And then sort of subsequently using e econometric modeling becomes possible to give a minimum price tag uh, for the, uh, the, the ship sheds. And since the ship sheds were mostly made of locally available materials, as we see in this slide, um, with the exception of roof timbers, so Athens had to export quite a bit of the uh, uh, timbers, large-scale timbers, from uh, uh, either from the north or, or uh, possibly from uh, Euboea. Then the, that results in the, uh, the construction costs are much higher than the material or trans uh, transport costs uh, for, the, the, uh, for the building projects. And the total workforce in the Piraeus to construct 10 ship sheds 
uh, so one complex so that what I've used as a, as a uh, basically a, a one unit uh, it doesn't really matter that much if you if you have uh, eight or twelve uh, um, uh, ship sheds, uh, ship sheds in, in, in a single complex um, it's actually very likely that in a single building season it would have been possible to build uh, the ten ship sheds with uh, less than 150 men working uh, so uh, actually 150 men is, is less than you need to man a single trireme um, and in total if all the 5th century uh, triremes were housed in a shed, uh, the half century between the Second Persian War and the Peloponnesian War would have witnessed uh, the construction of some 300 phase two uh, ship sheds. Uh, this project, based on, the, on these calculations, uh, would have required a minimum expenditure of uh, 1.2 million man days, or, or with 5th century prices, about 200 talents. And to put this sum into perspective, the 200 talents would have kept a fleet of 100 triremes uh, in the sea for a month or so. So not actually a huge uh, amount of money. Um, and and uh, some other ones, so Xenophon states that the annual income from the Athenian, uh, the Athenian income from the Dillian League was, uh, was in the region of uh, 1,000 talents. It could be exaggerated. But we can also see that, that uh, the uh, um, Isocrates claim that the cost of the 5th century uh, ship says was 1,000 talents is clear, clearly a rhetorical uh, exaggeration and that's there to emphasize that the, the damage done by the 30 tyrants when they were selling off the, the uh, uh, dismantling and selling off the uh, building materials uh, from the 5th century uh, ship sheds. And if you move on to then the uh, phase 3, so 4th century uh, uh, building uh, uh, building complex for the, the ship sheds, then um, I, I've estimated that it's actually only a slightly more that you would have needed workmen, so perhaps in the region of 200 men um, to complete the 10 uh, uh, ship sheds in a, a single uh, building season. And in general, the, um, uh, if we look at the first half of the 4th century, then the growing Athenian fleet would have been probably uh, served by the, the uh, just rebuilding uh, the damaged 5th uh, century uh, ship sheds. And uh, by some point of 350, uh, um, 330, you would have needed 100 new phase 3 uh, ship sheds. And they would have cost, uh, um, according to my calculation, that in the minimum uh, 460,000 man days or, or, or about 150 talents in the, with the inflated 4th uh, century uh, prices. The annual ace for a uh, of 10 talents that was collected, we know from the literary sources, was uh, collected between uh, 347 to 322, so 25 years. It would have quite possibly uh, met, or even actually probably met, the cost of the, these 100 um, uh, ship sheds, and possibly also the, the cost of the building uh, Philon's Arsenal, the Skevothiki, in uh, uh, Atsea. And, uh, and I think one critical thing is that that's a um, so improving uh, the, the ship shed design from the 5th century uh, into the 4th century has actually only a slightly more uh, higher price tag uh, for the 5th century. So it's only about 20% more expensive um, for the, the uh, 4th century uh, ship sheds than compared to the, the uh, 5th century ones. And uh, um, we should keep in mind that that's, um, um, the, the reasonable level of spending uh, on the harbour installations uh, in the Piraeus reflects the, the practical approach the Athenians were taking uh, towards uh, the military. So ostent ostent ostentatious building, so like the Acropolis, uh, was possible and acceptable and possibly also in, uh, sort of could be encouraged in the principal sanctuaries, but because of the sheer volume of the bu building in the harbours, it, it had to be uh, uh, economic, and, and uh, that, that's why the, the designs are, are quite um, relatively simple compared to the, uh, the rest of the, the, um, uh, the architecture, monumental architecture in, uh, in Athens. I'd like to uh, hand over to Calliope at this point. Mm. Uh, I think that's not on yet. So. Okay, other issues? Other issues that we consider 
in the, um, the study of the ship sets uh, were issues of topography and fortification. After the emergence of the big war fleets of, uh, at the end of the archaic period, uh, we experienced, of course, the creation of the first naval bases with um, um, big uh, shipset complexes. This led to the orga reorganization of the harbour space and um, different design of the naval, uh, naval city-states. From the archaic to the Hellenistic period, therefore, we can trace uh, the evolution of the shipset complexes and the harbour topography to, that led to the sophisticated uh, designs, the harbour designs of Carthage in the Hellenistic period. Already from the end of the 6th century BC at Abdera, we can see that the shipset complexes are attached to the ur urban fortification circuit, and this is one of the first elements. Whereas in Corfu, in the beginning of the 5th century BC, we see that we have a clear insertion of the naval base in the harbour topography. Already Corfu, it's uh, one of the first thalassocracies together with Syracuse, that they acquire significant trirem uh, war fleets in the beginning of the 5th century. Um, however, they have very complex geoarchaeological histories and it's a joy that um, there, there is new geoarchaeological study, a new project, in order to decipher um, the geological history of the city, a new project uh, coordinated by 8th of uh, prehistoric and classical antiquities. In Corfu, we have monumental construction of the naval base that has at least two phases in the beginning of the 5th century and then the Hellenistic period. And here is an hypothetical reconstruction by our colleague, Henny Herding, um, and the hypothetical uh, housing of uh, the 5th century triirem of uh, John Coates. What is exciting is that we can have new challenging questions, especially for the study of the estimation of the dimension of the first three rims, as until now we see that the classical the Athenian three rim models do not fit the Corcyrian and perhaps also the Sicily of Naxo ship sets. At Aegina in the 5th century BC, uh, we have a direct imminent connection of the urban with the harbour fortification. Aegina, Pyrrhus, Thassos and Corfu, um, we argue that there is a um, common public project. There are public projects in the construction of the urban circuits and the naval bases. In Thassos, we go even um, beyond. We have the Atichismata, harbour the Atichismata. The, therefore, the harbour zone is clearly divided by the urban space and is also one of the significant examples wh where we can study the connection of the naval base with the political agora. This is where the mastering station, that was the mastering station of, uh, um, uh, of uh, naval groups uh, before any uh, naval operation took place. In Piraeus, we argue that in fact in Hippodamian cities we can now um, we can now uh, see clearly that it's very possible that the design of the city started from the design of the naval base. Therefore, the naval base is well inserted in the city grid and the orientation of the main street access are connected, are connected major points in the Opodamian city grids. That means the harbours, the civic and the re religious spaces and of course the agoras. Of course, there is a big controversy of the location of the different agoras, the commercial and the political one in Piraeus, but there, there are more elements to, to argue that the Podamian agora was just near the naval bases of, uh, of Zea, well connected with the naval station in Munichia and the part of the naval station in Cantharos. Even more clearly, in the Hellenistic period, in the Podamian uh, design cities, we see a preconceived design of the naval base in the urban planning. This is clear in Rhodos, where the military harbour, the today Madraki harbour, is well defined by the city, city grid of, uh, of the city. And we also argue that one of the connecting points between the military, agora, the military harbour and the agora was a street that later acquired monumental dimensions. 
in Hellenistic coast, the division of the harbour zone from the urban space takes a more defined uh, um, form with the harbour diatichisma. And uh, we have new uh, epigraphical evidence of how the harbour space, the harbour zone, was uh, organized and its relation to the Argora and to the religious, uh, religious centre. Syracuse, uh, this is uh, an exciting example of how the topographical issues of naval harbours are now studied. It's very controversial, the reconstruction of the, um, uh, of the city grid and especially the orientation, the access of the city that would um, directly influence the location of the naval and the commercial harbours. And then the harbours of Mytilene and what Strabon calls the Tririki Limenes, uh, where we have new elements of how the harbours were divided, the Evripos that separated them, uh, new elements of uh, possibly remains of uh, ship sets in the south harbour of Mytilene, and um, new findings of, of harbour fortification walls on the north harbour. Finally, a different case is the maritime fortress of Iniade of the 4th, 5th, 4th century BC, where actually the maritime fortress is designed outside the closed harbour, the Christos Limin, and is a an sophisticated and uh, rare example of how this naval base is located and it's separated and fortified by an independent fortification system. All this leads, leads it to the progress of the study of Clistili means the closed harbors in the Mediterranean, a term that has been a lot discussed but not yet finally defined, though we have many examples from Stravon and the um, Skeptopsilax all over the Mediterranean. Many sites are now under study, though many of them have not yet, yet remains of the harbor complexes. Finally, another issue, long walls, the connections of the Opinion and the Asti. We know very well the examples of Piraeus, but now we have new elements for the long walls of Megara, Patra, and um, Corinth. Another issue that, is, um, uh, that we also uh, studied were rock cut and small scale, scale naval bases, mostly examples from the Aegean and from the Mediterranean. This kind of shipsets do not belong to the big uh, uh, shipset complexes of the naval bases. Um, therefore, among, beside the big scale naval bases, the port of calls of antiquity, um, all the naval uh, powers possessed um, a number of naval bases in the periphery, either in the Perea, either in maritime, maritime periphery. These are naval bases on clusters to one from one to, one to three ship sets, and most of them are totally or partly submerged. Um, one of the key elements is the geostrategic location in the Aegean, controlling very important maritime routes um, in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. We have examples from, um, uh, from the southern Greece, but now many examples are also coming from the Isa Minor and also Western um, uh, Western Mediterranean. A prototype, a very well example, is the um, rocket ship set in Citia in, uh, in Crete. And this is the results of the electronic survey. During the project, we did perform electronic survey on all, these, uh, on all known rocket um, ship sets in the Aegean. Um, they, have, um, um, they have very good advantages. Rocket ramps, most of them are rocket, all of them are rocket, the ones that we found, because this is what uh, uh, is preserved, of course, but we know that a lot of uh, other naval bases would have been located in uh, strategic positions all over the Aegean. We have just found the traces of the rocket ones. Um, as they are well preserved, they preserve also elements of the architecture, and we can have very good technical studies um, on um, technical matters, that means issues of hauling and launching. And uh, by cooperative study of rocket sections of ships and slipways in the Mediterranean, we can advance issues, uh, everyday ordinary mechanics that they were simple for the ancients, but we are still struggling to understand them. 
uh, rocket um, slip goes in Rithno, cluster in two, and they also have a very defined uh, position, usually in promontories and um, near uh, fortification points, near Acropolis and fortresses. One of the most significant is the naval base of Sunio that we surveyed during the project. The naval base is associated with the classical and the Hellenistic fortification um, that um, um, protects the settlement of Sunio. And uh, Judith McKenzie did the, this very nice um, association. We have um, controversy about the date of the naval Sunio, but she actually showed that there is an actual connection between the axe of the Temple of Poseidon and the back wall of the Sipsets. This uh, reinforced the theory already advanced uh, that the naval base was already uh, built uh, in the 5th century and uh, uh, as Thucydides in, um, informs us that in, at the end of the 5th century there was a big need to fortify the coastal settlements of uh, uh, the coastal fortresses. Oh, excuse me. Yes, this um, also uh, this was uh, was destined to the accommodation of two patrol and surveillance vessels, vessels smaller than the Trirem, and we have mostly focused our study in the Trirem, in the in the, in the, uh, in the dimensions and denominations of Trirem. But uh, we have a very exciting study now for smaller denomination of warships, mostly Hellenistic warships, and the second line of warships. Uh, they were used against sea raiders, piracy, and for the protection of the grain routes towards the metropolis, at least the ships that they were housed in the naval base of Sunion. Finally, as this kind of rock at slipways and um, ship sets are um, um, mostly submerged, this can give us very good indications of relative sea level change in the Aegean. And slips ship, and ship sets, if they are used with caution can be used as relative sea level markers, as for example uh, Sunion. Um, a lot of people have, um, um, have uh, um, a lot of people have um, collaborated and <laughs> And uh, with us, uh, of course, without the um, persistence and the help and the coordination of David Blackman, we wouldn't have been here today. Uh, but I would like to thank a lot of colleagues and friends that helped us a lot during the surveys and during all the 10 years of this uh, small adventure. Many of you are in the audience and our very warm thanks to all of you. Thank you.